Uh, hello everyone, my name is Blair Chantella. I'm an attorney, I practice here in the Atlanta metro area. Um, I've long studied these types of issues and uh, so I have a lot of informal expertise on them. And I'll just hand, on the, hand the mic down the line here and we'll do a quick introduction since we're running a little bit late. And then we'll just uh, dive right in. Hi, um, uh, I'm Ishan. I am a graduate student at Georgia Tech. I also work for the Internet Governance Project and we deal with a lot of privacy, security, internet access kind of issues. Uh, Nathan White, I work with an organization called Access Now. Before that, I worked as a consultant <coughs> with several civil liberties groups like Demand Progress. And before that, I worked for Congress for five years uh, for a congressman who wanted to abolish the NSA and then a government oversight pan uh, committee as well. Uh, I'm Mac Blaze. I'm a professor at uh, in the computer science department at uh, UPenn. And I've been studying uh, security, cryptography, and surve surveillance and the relation to public policy stuff for a long time. OK, so um, what do we mean by Vault 7? Is anyone here familiar with that already? OK, I'm seeing about five hands, maybe. Um, Vault 7 is probably one of the biggest uh, underreported leaks in history. Um, I would say it's up there with the Panama Papers as far as press coverage and at least here in the United States. Um, but essentially what it is is a huge leak of internal CIA documents uh, on a variety of different programs. Everything from hacking Apple's iPhones to uh, turning Samsung TVs into listening devices to air gap, uh, bridging air gaps uh, between computers when there's no internet or network between them. Uh, via USB drives or CD-ROM drives. Um, basically, it is a, uh, a massive database of weapons that the CIA uses in their operations. Uh, and then it was released to WikiLeaks, um, reportedly uh, from employees, but we don't know 100% for sure. Uh, and then WikiLeaks has been releasing them in batches. And I w to WikiLeaks' credit, they have been redacting some of the uh, names and important information, uh, as well as the source code, uh, in order to prevent people from taking advantage of these weapons, essentially, cyber weapons. Um, and so they've been releasing them in batches, and you can go online and you can read all about them. And um, there's a delay, but they do eventually release more information uh, about these weapons, uh, more details about them. Uh, and they also provide, typically, have provided companies who, whose products are vulnerable to have uh, inside access to the information so they can patch the vulnerabilities, but that's not always the case. Um, so with that quick introduction, is there anything, just feel free to jump in, and then if you have any, anyone has any questions, uh, just raise your hand, and we'll pass the box and, and get it to you. So. Anything to add? Sure, um, so I mean, what's interesting is to compare the Vault 7 leaks to the Snowden um, uh, documents. Um, Snowden was uh, had access to a trove of uh, highly classified NSA documents, some about operational stuff, some about uh, tools, and as you know, that's been um, some of those documents still haven't been published and still are being published. <coughs> but those focused on the tools used by the uh, by the NSA, which has largely been the focus both prior to Snowden and after, has been kind of the focus of our attention um, in um, thinking about the best tools of government surveillance. But what's interesting about them is the NSA's tools, um, at least as reflected in Snowden, are focused on communications infrastructure, <coughs> on what's called SIGINT, um, and uh, both collection of things over the wire, internet traffic, uh, big... Uh, um, interception points both in, in the United States and elsewhere done both surreptitiously and with the carrier's cooperation, not to mention any companies like AT&T, um, that uh, were um, uh, providing access um, uh, wittingly to really large pipes that have international, in some cases, domestic traffic. And that's been largely the focus of what in our imaginations we thought um, government surveillance kind of looked like and the reality of what the NSA is doing seems to have kind of matched um, uh, you know 
on a larger scale kind of what people had imagined was going on. The, the Vault 7 tools are different. Um, they're very different in character. They're much less focused on intercepting communications infrastructure and much more focused on targeted attacks against devices. These are, these are tools for um, compromising cell phones, for uh, compromising uh, consumer devices. We don't know what all of them are because they, you know, they haven't been all released yet, but they're much more focused on endpoints and on um, the devices used by specific targets than they are about being able to do general SIGINT style interception. Now that's extremely unsurprising when you think about it because the mission of the NSA is collection of SIGINT and the mission of the CIA is targeted intelligence gathering. So, you know, it, we would absolutely expect the NSA to have the sort of stuff that um, was released in Snowden, uh, and we would absolutely expect that the CIA would be interested in having the kinds of stuff that's come out so far in the Vault 7, um, in the Vault 7 leaks. Um, so these are tools that do things like exploit vulnerabilities, um, that some of which are already known, many of which turn out to be zero-day vulnerabilities that weren't known. Uh, and, um, you know, what they've done now, now between the Snowden trove and the Vault 7 trove, we now have a much more complete picture of the tools that a well-funded nation state can mm -hmm. use to gather both general and targeted intelligence. So, you know, I think these are interesting both individually, you know, hey, there's this vulnerability in, you know, this version of Android, but they're also interested, interesting as a whole because this gives us a kind of picture of what those capabilities look like and also what capabilities seem to be absent. Yeah, that, that's a great point to uh, separate between the Snowden leaks and the Vault 7 leaks. Um, my reaction to them is fairly similar but lead me to different places. My, my first reaction is, wow, that's cool. They've got really good hackers. Mm -hmm. And second, wow, that's creepy. I really wish they couldn't do that. Uh, and third is, how are human rights implicated in this? And that's where things are a little bit different. And with the NSA, the tools that they have are scooping up bulk collection about all of us so that all of our information is going into a database that is then searched or, or analyzed. Um, that is a different human rights implication than uh, the CIA tools, which are saying we have a reason to go after this person, this end point, and we've built tools to be able to get into that. And, and as Matt says, it's not surprising that they've built really good tools to help them do what they, they've said. So where I end up on, on the CIA uh, leaks is the human rights impacts of well, they have these tools, they know they lost these tools, they couldn't protect these tools, they inevitably ended up in the public domain where they can, whether or not the source code is released, uh, people can reverse engineer them, certainly other nation states knowing that this is possible are putting resources into it. Um, so that leads me to concerns about uh, the vulnerabilities equities process, uh, which is a term most people outside of academia or DC have never heard of, and even inside academia in DC. It, it's a pretty rare and obscure thing, but I, I think it's important for this conversation. And that is, the government is going to hack into devices. The government is never going to say, well, that is a high value target, but we just can't get to it. They're always going to try. And a lot of times they're going to be successful because no technology is perfect. The question is then, what do they do with that? If you have a hack or you have a zero day, do you save that information for the next high value target? Do you go to the provider and say, hey, we figured out a way into your, your system, you might want to fix that uh, in future updates? Or do they share it with other friendly governments? Uh, the question on an individual basis is difficult, but it's really important on a mass basis because now we know there are these big collections of ways to get into tools, or ways to get into our devices and undermine our security. And CIA, the WikiLeaks, have just proven 
they can't protect it forever. Eventually this information will get out to other people and eventually it might be somebody who doesn't redact the source code. They might publish the source code on a zero day for our iPhone before Apple has had a single chance to, a single day to try to fix it and then all of us will have a terrible, you know, well a terrible time, our security is going to be undermined, we're all going to get hacked. Um, so it, my initial reaction and immediate when I first saw this was, oh man, we are in trouble if they're going to start releasing this uh, to the general public. And I'm grateful that they have uh, shown some responsibility and not done that. Yeah, and um, I think just to add to that, I think this also sort of leads to the discussion is how responsible should these agencies be towards their own gathered intelligence, right? If you are part of the largest intelligence appar apparatus in the world, uh, should there be some accountability towards the damage caused uh, by whatever intelligence you've gathered to the civilian public? Like, if the zero day, the fact that the IOS has a zero day <coughs> means that not only the CIA can find it, any other foreign nation state or a rogue actor can find it too. and if the CIA's responsibility is to protect US citizens, a lot of whom have iPhones, is it their responsibility to tell Apple to fix that zero day or is it their responsibility to hide it and then eventually have it leaked and probably cause more damage? So I think it's this uh, argument for how best do we protect uh, our digital tools and creating that balance between patching and finding vulnerabilities. You know, it, it, something you said made me want to, we should throw this out there. The CIA has really, really good hackers. The NSA has really, really good hackers. But the United States government is not the only smart people in the world. Uh, I, we know about what the U.S. government is doing because of leaks, but it would be really a, a big mistake to think that only the U.S. government does this. Uh, hacking requires brain power, but it's not that difficult. Uh, n North Korea has actually got some pretty good hackers. Look at the Sony hack. Uh, Russia, China, Iran, even Pakistan, a lot of nations have nation state capabilities. Uh, we talk about the US because of the leaks and we have information so we can point to it and discuss it and delve into the details. But we should not for a moment think that this is limited to the United States government or they are the only ones who can figure this stuff out. Yeah, I mean sort of one of the one of the things that I work on is, you know, finding security vulnerabilities in things and in protocols and in implementations and so on. And you know, my students and I do this stuff and you know, there's this great feeling that you get. Um, when you discover a flaw in something and you know that feeling starts with this like some sort of chemical is released in your brain that makes you think very briefly that you are the smartest person in the world to have figured this out and it's absolutely wonderful um, and, but it's and very seductive to think I've, I've discovered this and I've discovered this thing that nobody else is smart enough to discover and then you know you come back to reality in a minute and you realize you know I might be a little smarter than some people, but you know I'm not smarter than everybody, and um, you know somebody else is going to be able to find this, and maybe already has, and maybe um, is using it for bad things, or maybe you know will will report it, and we really have no way of knowing, um, and that's one of the fundamental conundrums of this vulnerabilities equities process is that when you discover something, it's really, really hard to calculate the chances or the amount of time that you would expect before someone else is going to rediscover the same thing. So even if you trust the US government to only use this for good, and you know, people are going to disagree about that. But let's assume that we, you know, we all decide that the, you know, any vulnerabilities that the US government knows are are, you know, U.S. government can be trusted to use them only for, you know, truth, justice, and the American way. Um, the, you know, uh, how do we know that someone else hasn't found and is exploiting the same things? Yeah, that just, I mean, this is not the first time either that this massive amount or this type of information has been used. Um, a couple of recent examples, relatively recent, are the heart bleed, 
uh, virus, was it? Uh, I don't know the technical term for it, but worm, was it? Well, the, I mean, the, it's the vulnerability. The, vul the, the vulnerability, uh, Heartbleed was back in 2014, um, and a lot of people accuse the NSA of having knowledge of that beforehand. And then in 2015, you have Hacking Team, uh, an Italian company, which was hacked. <laughs> and uh, uh, as a result of that, we got to see that their company was essentially selling these private cyber weapons to a variety of countries uh, used by oppressive regimes. Um, so there is definitely a market for these types of things. And when they're found, there are a lot of malicious actors who will use them for their own personal benefit, uh, for money, uh, for political reasons. Um, the if, if I can jump in, I want to I get to that, but I, wa I have to make a step first to get, get to respond to that. I, I want to define, define what I've been talking about with this vulnerabilities equities process. Uh, for some of us in this community, we've been talking about this issue for a long time. We're aware the government is building tools, but we have no idea what they're doing with the tools or how long they're keeping the tools or even how many they have. Uh, and under the previous administration, they finally decided to write a memo to outline what they defined as the vulnerabilities equities process, where the heads of agencies and senior government people come together some amount of time, look at what tools they have in their kit and decide, is this a valuable tool? Are we getting active intelligence on it? Could we replicate the intelligence if we didn't have this tool? What is the risk that it's going to be exposed? And what would the damage be done if it was exposed? And then supposedly they decide whether or not to go to the vendor and say, hey, there's a problem here, you should patch this. Um, we don't really know much about that process at all, except that it was outlined in a memo that they said they have this process. That was nice that they told us they had a process, but one of the things about this leak that was so terrifying was this process seems to have broken down. Some of these tools date back to, I think, is it 2006? That's probably wrong. Definitely through 2013. Um, uh, so that means the earliest one I looked when it came out was 2013, but I think there's been some tools that were still active for longer than that. Uh, that means that this process <coughs> wasn't really working. Uh, they had these tools for many years. Maybe they were really, really valuable tools, but then they know that they got stolen in 2016 and they still continue to use them, and some of them may or may not have been patched through the vendor. So now we have more and more questions about this vulnerability equities process of, does it actually exist? Are you actually meeting? How do you weigh the chance that it's going to be leaked versus the, the value? Who are these factors? Um, the previous administration said they tended toward disclosure, but that doesn't seem to be the case if these tools were not patched. Um, the reason why this vulnerability equities process is so important and why I'll tend toward disclosure is so important is because w what Matt was saying is that other folks can do this as well. And what Blair is saying is that there is an entire private industry around the world that looks for these things and sells these things. Um, we know what some of the prices are for them, uh, but my organization gets terrified when we see this stuff pop up in the wild. Uh, in ways that you may not expect. Uh, we recently uh, worked with some activists in Mexico City who are campaigning the government of Mexico on childhood obesity, uh, trying to get things like standards on sugar in children's meals. They Pretty dangerous people. <laughs> terrifying people. The, uh, clearly not the enemies of the people, not the enemies of democracy, not even the enemies of capitalism. Maybe, maybe, I guess you could make that argument. Uh, but they found there was something going on on their phone, and so they sent some, some of their uh, emails to us, and we worked with the Citizen Lab a group in Toronto. And we looked at their phone, and we found malware that was designed by an Israeli company called the NSO Group that sells their malware directly to governments, uh, governments like Turkey to, and Saudi Arabia to monitor dissidents and to conduct counterespionage. Somehow they had sold it to someone who was conducting espionage on children's obesity activists. Uh, it, it, so this this kind of stuff, the 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 vulnerabilities exist, and the longer that we know about them and don't tell people, the greater the chance for human rights to be implicated and for people who you do not think are a threat to be exposed and to have their information uh, uh, so hacked. I, I'm going to just uh, give a little bit of a alternative view for, for a moment. And it's, it's one that I don't 
fully subscribe to. Um, well, I don't fully subscribe to the conclusion, but it is worth noting <coughs> that the vast majority, you know, if you haven't noticed, the Internet's a horribly insecure place. Um, and things get attacked constantly, and, you know, if you uh, don't keep up with the latest patches, and even if you do, you're, you know, at enormous risk all the time, right? So we all kind of know that, and there are things you can do to kind of lock things down um, that, that will make you more secure. Most of the practical threats that most of us face are not, in fact, these romanticized zero-day vulnerabilities. They're things that were discovered weeks, months, years even earlier that simply either haven't yet been fixed by the vendor or that have been fixed but you're running an outdated version of some piece of software that still keeps you vulnerable to it. So, you know, the thing that most people need to worry about is not um, the, you know, some government uh, entity uh, attacking them with a zero-day vulnerability, which, you know, by definition, a zero-day vulnerability doesn't stay a zero-day vulnerability for very long once it starts to be used against, uh, 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 against targets. Uh, but, but the more important problem is making sure that vulnerabilities that we know about actually do get patched and that your devices really are up to date with all those latest patches. So it's a little bit tempting to, you know, focus the discussion so much on, on the secret zero days used by intelligence agencies because that is a really sexy problem. But the, you know, the reality of sort of internet security for, for both normal people and activists and everyone else is, you know, keep things up to date, make sure that you're, you're you know, you're, you're, you're doing all the really boring stuff mm -hmm. uh, before you can even start to worry about the, the sexy zero days. If anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Here. While that, that, oh, never mind. I already got it. I was going to say, while that's going out, uh, I, I want to respond to that. Something that jumped into my mind is that uh, it has not been confirmed, but it's widely believed that uh, the U.S. government worked with the is Israeli government to target Iran's nuclear program. Uh, they had a big problem that these are custom-built computer systems uh, that are air-gapped. And so they built all these really interesting ways to get onto an air-gapped computer network, like building the USB with able to hide a payload behind uh, the hardware that's already on it. All this technological wizardry that went into targeting and ultimately setting back in a, the uh, Iranian nuclear program, how they got it onto the air-gapped machines leaving USB sticks lying around. So uh, yeah. it makes me think of, you're right, there's all this out there and it's sexy and it's interesting, but for most of us, and even the high profile targets are the high value targets, it's really the mundane stuff that's actually the most important for us as users to pay attention to. It's incredibly valuable. It's an incredibly valuable defense, and it's incredibly boring to tell people. <laughs> you know, but you know, make sure to brush your teeth after every meal and floss. Uh, yeah. So, you were speaking about uh, the company in Israel. It's kind of funny that we have those same type of companies stateside that even offer tech support when you can't get something done. Uh, the, the NSO Group is an Israeli company. It's actually owned by a holding company called the San Francisco Partners, which is based in San Francisco. And until about a week and a half ago, they were trying to sell that branch to Blackstone, which is one of the largest holding companies in the world. Uh, so it's an Israeli group, but it's actually owned by American Finance. Um, you had mentioned earlier that um, in some cases the uh, I guess it's WikiLeaks, has released the source code for the vulnerabilities to the vendors of the compromised systems, um, which implies that in some cases they haven't. Do we have any idea what the rationale is behind their deciding whether or not to make that available to the vendor? Um, I had watched the interview with the press release with Julian Assange. I don't recall exactly, but um, if you go online, then you can find his rationale at least. 
you know whether that's genuine or not I'll let you All right I, I have also uh, sure somebody can correct me if I'm wrong but I've not heard from any company's independent verification that that actually happened other than Julian Assange claiming they were uh, I have a question so um, with the vault 7 revelations we've talked a lot about whether the companies knew about the particular zero days that were in those revelations but in the Snowden revelations, there was a lot of, like through PRISM, there was a lot of cooperation between American corporations and the U.S. government. <coughs> How much cooperation, if any, do you believe there's evidence for between corporations and the government in Vault 7? I haven't, I've, I haven't read every word that's been released, which I don't, you know, I don't think anybody has. But... Um, that so far in what's been released, which is some subset, and we don't know how big a subset or how representative it is, so far there's l relatively little evidence that that stuff has been done with the cooperation of the, the vendors that are being attacked. Also, fundamentally, um, the Vault 7 leaks show how the CIA was attacking the technological security of you know, the iOS system or the Android system, and the NSA leaks, it's more about getting them the communications which are done through, you know, Google, Facebook, whatever. So the NSA leaks don't tell us that much about the NSA hacking into an algorithm by a Silicon Valley company. It's more about them cooperating to give them the communications done on their <coughs> channels. And the Walt 7 is precisely breaking apart whatever security measures these companies have used. So, I mean, it's conceivable there could be smoking guns yeah. like that in there. Like, you know, uh, some reference to, here's the secret Android backdoor that Google put in for us, but there hasn't been any yeah. in there. Th yeah. there's, there's also d a difference between uh, voluntary and compelled assistance. That uh, with the NSA leaks, there was uh, legal rationale for compelled assistance and, and also uh, some money to help that. Uh, but for a long time, a lot of the infrastructure was run by a few companies, AT&T in particular, and some of that assistance was voluntary. Um, it's difference between domestic mass bulk surveillance for signals intelligence and targeted foreign exploit. Um, so I, I imagine that kind of assistance might not necessarily need to be compelled or written down if you can go to a provider and say, you know, <laughs> we've got to stop Iran from getting nuclear weapons and we need you to help us do this and it's not taking place in the United States uh, so there's no law that is preventing you from doing this, please help us out. Um, that, that could be possible but I haven't seen anything that says one way or another whether the companies were complicit in this. So you just touched a little bit about what I was about to ask. Um, San Bernardino. We, uh, there was a whole big thing in the news about the FBI trying to get assistance to get into a phone, and they ended up buying the ability to hack into the phone for a large amount of money. Um, why did they make a whole big stink if they had the ability to go and purchase a tool? And is that something that's just readily available, or was it like a one-time thing? So, you know, yeah. So, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. So first of all, it doesn't appear that the same capability, at least so far, the same capability you, that the FBI bought um, does not appear to be reflected in the Vault 7 leaks um, that have been released so far. So, you know, that specifically may or may not have been in that toolkit. But even if it was, I think we would expect that the FBI would not have wanted to or been permitted to use it. And the reason is that in a criminal investigation like San Bernardino, because, uh, you know, anything, any capability the FBI has is at much greater risk of being exposed if a case goes to trial. And so they try very hard to strongly separate tools used for intelligence um, from tools used for law enforcement if the tools themselves are sensitive. Uh, because you don't want a, an intelligence capability to be compromised because of a criminal prosecution. So it's almost certainly the case that the FBI and the CIA would, would, would draw a line around these capabilities. Um, also, just a fun fact, the Israeli company Celebrate, which helped the FBI, is also owned by U.S. financial backers. That is a fun fact. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
it might it might be a, a slight tangent, but uh, it's interesting to think about why the FBI pursued that case. They they had the shooter, they had the evidence. Why did they file that case? Um, full disclosure: my organization filed an amicus brief uh, in support of Apple pushing back against that um, that order. Um, but I think that might have been a political moment. They thought it was a good moment. They had domestic terrorists. They had blood in the streets. They wanted Apple support. They're worried about the rise of encryption. And I think they had a good moment that they would be able to bully Apple or be able to get public opinion on their side. And I think they made a, the wrong choice and miscalculated and, and set themselves back. Sure, I, I, I would imagine if they could open it, they would definitely want to open it. But. Well, they're also, you know, we're going at it for, you know, someone who's Muslim and a person of color, but, oh, you know, all the white men that shoot people are mm -hmm. hacking into their iPhones. No. <laughs> I mean, it's completely virtual. Probably the Okay, so cool. We know that there are vulnerabilities and specifically iPhone and Android, um, I guess Windows phones too. Can we not just get a VPN on our phone and be safe again? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Yeah, so I mean, the short, the short answer is against the NSA stuff, you know, encryption and things like that work really well. These are targeting, these are, things are targeting your device itself, which is where the encryption keys live. So um, encryption doesn't help. I yeah, know that was a concern when, when this happened is that, you know, whether the encryption itself was penetrated, like there are apps like WhatsApp and Signal, and I think the ultimate determination was that it had not been, that the attacks had happened before the encryption occurred or had happened after the encryption had occurred. Had occurred. So the cryptography itself was not at least subject to that vulnerability. It wasn't that wasn't the method through which they uh, got what they wanted. So, you know, cryptography is not a panacea for everything. There's other ways they break into the device. A lot of times through user error and stuff like that too. So, thank you very much. You should still use a, a VPN though. By the way, that, that <laughs> that's a great thing. Uh, it's actually very difficult to recommend a particular VPN um, because most of them, you don't know exactly how they're treating your data. Uh, fortunately, one of the biggest ones, TunnelBear, just did a third-party audit, a uh, third-party security audit, and released the information. Uh, so I think that's a great step, and I'd like to publicly thank them and reward them by mentioning their name for doing that. So it's, it's a good step. Hi. Um do we have any sense of how often these kinds of tools are used not by governments against civilians but for corporate espionage? That's a great question. Um, I don't know how we would quantify that or how we would know. Um, it, I don't think the there's any statistics that, on it, are well, there? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, the Obama administration's deal with the Chinese government to say, stop doing this for economic purposes. And there was, seemed to be some amount of agreement among the U.S. intelligence agencies that that agreement is holding. Um, so I imagine there is some way that the, uh, the FBI or the CERT uh, would be able to, to see that. Um, maybe that we've hacked their hacking teams and we know what they're getting or, or watching their exfiltration. Um, but I, I don't know how that we would quantify that other than the Obama administration seemed to claim some credit for curbing that. At least domestically, we could kind of look at corporate espionage, criminal prosecutions. And you know, in the United States, uh, the number of technical um, uh, attacks from one US company to another um, to try to do uh, corporate espionage kind of rounds down to zero. Most of the, the, the virtually all the cases involve like hiring ex-employees and they talk about things that violate their non-disclosure agreements. They, you know, they don't seem to spy on each other by technical means, at least not enough to. Because it's too expensive. Yeah. I mean, especially with the and, tools we're talking about. And here. it's like obviously illegal. 
question right there. Um, when there's hacking done like um, Angela Merkel's cell phone done to U.S. allies, what is the, the benefit to doing that when that kind of paints the U.S. in a dubious light to go through and actually hack allies? That, that's a great question. Uh, one of the things that Edward Snowden said, the reason he was radicalized was he saw the tools that we were developing used in Berlin, not for you know great reasons of like stopping Iranian nuclear program, but for ruining people's lives to develop a source in case maybe someday you need to know the German crop output a week before it's released publicly. Um, one of the things we work on uh, in terms of limiting surveillance at the policy level is to try to limit the definition of a foreign intelligence purpose. That right now a lot of laws are written that you can use these tools, that agents can use these tools for a foreign intelligence purpose. And that is very broadly defined. Almost anything can be a foreign intelligence purpose. If we are trying to go into a trade negotiation, it would be helpful to know what the German crop report is a week early. Um, Limiting that to things like nuclear nonproliferation and uh, counterterrorism uh, would make it more difficult for uh, agents in the field to use this kind of stuff in ways that we might feel a little more icky about. And there have been like real consequences in, inter in international relationships because of, you know, Vault Seven and itself. Uh, the, equi uh, the German equivalent of the FBI conducted an investigation to look at how many. Uh, ministers in the German cabinet have been investigate have been attacked through Vault Seven leaks and stuff like that. And you know when uh, we want to say uh, we want to have safe harbor or stuff like that, when we say that we care about privacy and security, this is a major blow against the U.S. saying uh, in those negotiations. I also think there's a distinction we need to draw between stuff that legitimately needs to be private and then stuff that is just they're ashamed of it just because it becomes public. So like when the diplomatic cables were released, there's a lot of stuff in there where there's you know trusting between the people in the conversation and we kind of need that um, privacy to talk about things and discuss important international relations. But at the same time, if we're spying on you know our allies for those sort of very minor reasons, um, we need to think maybe we just shouldn't do it in the first place. As opposed to, you know, there is, you know, so I think that the mindset is, is that you ask why they do it. I think it's basically because I didn't think they get caught. That's the reason. So what can we as, as average citizens do to get them to stop or, or at least to limit their, their activities? So the most immediate and tangible thing is, you know, update your apps, update your systems, uh, use a VPN, use strong passwords, use a password authenticator. Um, it, it, all the, the boring brush your teeth and floss kind of thing as an individual. At a policy level, um, there is a uh, surveillance authority that is set to expire at the end of this year unless Congress proactively reauthorizes it. Um, I think Congress probably will reauthorize it, and it's a slightly different than the CIA, what we're talking about now, but it's a surveillance authority. Uh, and I would suggest looking into that and participating into the political process of you know, supporting groups like mine, and I see people from the Electronic Frontier Foundation who work on this, um, to, to make sure that we're limiting the laws in wonky but important ways, like the definition of foreign intelligence value. Um, it, that's uh, 702 of the FISA Surveillance Act, I think. So it's 702. Yeah. <laughs> there was a panel on uh, hacking the voting machines, and the two gentlemen felt like that was that did not happen and could not happen. Perhaps. What are your thoughts on that? On that one. I, I guess I have some thoughts on that. So, um, <coughs> so I think it's really, really interesting. So, I, uh, by way of background, I've been studying voting machine technology uh, for about uh, um, 15 years uh, now, since the Help America Vote Act mandated that states replace their voting technology with the mostly awful equipment. Uh, and I participated in uh, a couple of studies. 
um, it was sponsored by California and Ohio that did kind of top to bottom reviews of their voting machines in 2007. Most of those machines are still in use in various places around the country. And what we found uh, was basically, you know, every single, you know, to a first approximation, I don't want to paint it with too broad a brush, but every single electronic voting technology used in the United States is riddled with vulnerabilities at every level that would, you know, th that would make it plausible for somebody to influence uh, the outcome of an election um, or disrupt an election with the kind of access that maybe a poll worker or even a voter might have. So that's pretty disturbing. And we've known that these vulnerabilities exist in these machines. Some of them may have been patched. Some of them have definitely not. Now, fast forward to 2016, 2016 election. We don't know everything about the investigation that's gone on from that, but some documents have come out, such as the reality winner um, documents that were uh, released um, uh, earlier this year um, from NSA that, uh, that describe a piece of an NSA and FBI investigation um, into the 2016 hacking. And the very first thing that I'm going to, to you know, uh, look for there is to say, okay, what of the many vulnerabilities that exist in these voting machines do they appear to have tried to exploit? And the answer is none of them. And it's not because they didn't know about them, because these are really easy to find, but because there are actually easier options. What they did was um, phishing attacks and Trojan horse uh, um, uh, attachments sent over email to voting officials um, that would ultimately get on and disrupt the networks uh, that m manage the voter registration databases and the provisioning systems for the voting machines and the stuff that actually operates the day-to-day -day elections. They decided to bypass the stuff that you would do by attacking the electronic voting machines and go straight to the back-end systems um, using the same kind of boring floss and, and brush your teeth after every meal um, vulnerabilities that um, uh, you know plague everybody. So why do they do that? Because you know, yeah, there are vulnerabilities in these things, but there are also vulnerabilities in the back-end systems that, that are easier to exploit. And uh, just talking about Georgia, I work with an organization called Electronic Frontiers Georgia, and we had a session with two state representatives, and uh, their answer pretty much was the same thing, that we know these systems have, are not secure, and uh, they're trying to get funding to build bear systems and replace them. Be and the uh, what EVMs in Georgia have been in place for I think 15 years now or something like that. So no system which is which has been built 15 years ago is secure today. So I think uh, it's just a matter of if it can be done. I think it can be done. Has the EVM itself been hacked? Probably no because there are easier systems out there to exploit. That's a good question. We're giving like the least comforting answer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the Cyber Information Sharing Act? Yes. Okay. Uh, so the Cyber Information Sharing Act, which went through a bunch of different names, uh, was an idea that has gone back for a very long time with law enforcement going to companies and saying, you know, what can we do to collectively be better at cybersecurity? And the idea was, well, wouldn't it be nice if we could share information about the attack? So if Target... Uh, saw a breach or knew that they were being attacked, they could share that information with law enforcement who could then share that information with other companies and other companies could be on the lookout. It sounded like a decent idea uh, and when some of the other things that were being considered were much more difficult, uh, Congress kind of s focused in on that of like, okay, let's work on that. Um, it took them several years for them to even get legislation, and by the time they came up with legislation, most people in the security world didn't really think it was going to matter that much, thought, okay, sh sure, maybe that will be useful, uh, but Congress sort of focused in on it. Unfortunately, the execution, at least from my opinion, um, was not great. The, the concern was companies don't want to share this information with law enforcement because, one, they don't want to admit they were hacked. Uh, two, they don't want to be blamed for being hacked. Uh, 
Three, they're worried that they might get sued, they might uh, face bad public relations, or they might accidentally share information that was protected through some other privacy regime that they're not supposed to, to share in bulk. So the idea was, let's just give them blanket immunity to companies that if you share information with us through this system, then you will be fine, and then we will share that information with other companies. So they've created this system, and it's now been in, in place for about two years, and okay, now a company can share if they want. Doesn't seem to actually be doing that much that companies aren't sharing all that much. Maybe some of them are and we aren't hearing about it, um, but it doesn't seem to really have done much for corporate cybersecurity. Unfortunately, it does have problems for your personal security because they're now sharing information into government databases that you don't know about that are being shared among the government in ways that you don't know. They're also sharing information uh, in addition to cyber threat indicators that may in aggregate be personally identifiable information. Um, as, a, as a general consumer, it would not be my biggest fear about my privacy. Uh, but at a policy level, I think it's indicative of a government that doesn't really know what it's doing and wants to be seen as trying to do something and has uh, mixed results at best, potentially bad results. Fun fact, uh, a lot about what we know about how the NSA programs work in reality is from a report commissioned by the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, uh, who looked at the 215 program, which was the domestic metadata uh, collecting for all of our phone calls, uh, and published a very extensive report on how that works, how minimization procedures work, who gets out information, what they're shared. Uh, but their mandate is explicitly limited to counterterrorism. Uh, and throughout that report and throughout the way that the people who work for there talk, uh, they hint that there is a similar program using cyber threat indicators, uh, which is one of my theories for why the government really wanted this, is they take the cyber threat indicators of a compromise at Target or Sony, then they can do background, uh, backbone searches of the internet for those same cyber threat indicators, look at where information is being exfiltrated, and watch what's being stolen by, foreign st by nation state actors as it's happening. But that's my paranoid theory. Any more questions? Everybody's ready to go, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> All right, here's some of the, just to give a few examples till we, oh, we have one back there. I don't know if you discussed net neutrality, um, whether it's going to stick with us, whether the attack on it currently is going to take it away, um, and then who ultimately benefits and what the, uh, what do you feel the outcome would be if, uh, if there was no uh, net neutrality? I, I, I've been talking about net neutrality through, since 2010. I guess I can continue. Um, uh, for anybody who doesn't know, net neutrality is the concept that uh, your ISPs, your internet service providers, treat all data equally. Um, they can't speed up or slow down content as you're requesting it. So if you ask for you know, Nathan White at blogspot.com, that traffic is treated the exact same as DragonCon. DragonCon's much bigger than me, but they can't pay for prioritized access. Um, lots of ISPs want to get rid of that because they can make money by prioritizing access. They can sell, they can go to Netflix and say, you are taking up a lot of our bandwidth, we will make sure that you get to your customers if you pay us. Um, there's lots of human rights and economic implications for that, and so a lot of people have been trying to stop it from happening. In 2015, the previous administration's FCC passed explicit bright line rules that banned paid prioritization, banned slowing down content, uh, and gave quite a few protections for consumers. The current FCC is examining or is considering revoking that rule. Um, which will most likely generate lawsuits and potentially congressional activity. Um, the, I would encourage you to contact the FCC, but unfortunately the comment period to reply to that just ended last week. 
so now I encourage you to call your members of Congress, your senators, and let them know that you are interested in this. <coughs> and this is one area where I can be really, really optimistic because this is an area we are, we are going to win eventually. We are going to win net neutrality. We might lose the 2015 rules because this FCC chairman it seems committed, but ultimately we are going to win. 88% of people who know what net neutrality is support it, including 83% of Republicans. The problem is only 45% of people have ever heard of net neutrality. If we bump that up 10%, if 60% of people in the United States know what net neutrality is and 80% of them support it, I guarantee you Congress will take action or uh, prevent the FCC from taking action and we will eventually get this. Uh, so even if we lose in the short term, don't lose faith, keep on it. This is one that we're gonna win. Right. We, we have to win it before the nuclear war. <laughs> well, I don't have optimistic things to say about that one, Matt. Come on. <laughs> I saw the opportunity to be optimistic and happy and end the conference on, an, on a positive note. You just, just ripped it. I'm sorry. I'm a security person. That's against my nature. <laughs> you ripped it from literal cold dead hands. <laughs> Not literal. Uh, but just to, about the neutrality thing. Uh, be careful when you look at media outlets and a lot of stories on neutrality because I think a lot of ISPs are now starting to co-opt the term to say that they are net neutral when you know they are by definition not at least the thing they're advocating for is not so um, yeah but that I just shows that we're winning I mean no one can say I'm against net neutrality even the other side that is trying to get rid of net neutrality they can't even say I'm against net neutrality they say well, I'm for net neutrality, but That's I don't want I mean, any rules. Okay. I don't want to. I don't want to murder puppies. I just don't want there to be a rule to say that I can't murder puppies. Okay. <laughs> it's just it's nonsensical. But the fact that we're pushing them into making that argument yeah, to me shows we're winning. Is there a question? Yes, I. Um, I'm interested to know because I'm on the board of directors of one of the local community computer user groups. Do you guys uh, Skype into user groups? Is, uh, can you re refer us to get more information in our local groups? Uh, what, do you, what do you mean by Skype in? Like to, to chat well, with your group or to, like, where to find information? We have discovered that um, for a while, the Atlanta Macintosh users group was at one time one of the largest user groups in Atlanta. And at this point in time, because there's so much information online, People no longer consider the physical meeting together kind of user group to be priority. Mm. So we don't have the funds and the resources to hire one of you guys to just come out for 30 people. So in, a, in many cases, instead of, uh, for a while they were doing presentation in a box where we could take out the CD and play it on the projector screen and read the script and, and do the presentations in that way. And now it just seems easier just to Skype on the big screen. Yeah. Uh, well, I can't speak for anybody else, but it's always nice to be invited to things. I'm sure if you wanted to reach out to us, we, we could figure out some way to, to chat with your group. Great. Thank you. Hey. Um, so I have a question. Um, so with all of these vulnerabilities being released in Vault 7 and the huge economic implications on the companies that are having these vulnerabilities, you know, Apple, Android, um, so on. Um, do these companies have grounds for suing the U.S. government for creating these vulnerabilities? Well, they didn't create the vulnerabilities. Or they not found creating the, the vulnerabilities, but weaponizing them, sorry. Well, n no, I, I think probably not that, you know, espionage is legal. I mean, the CIA has killed people and overthrown governments. You know, finding a malware and, you know, turning on somebody's iPhone remotely is probably on the lower end of shady they, things they the CIA has in done in their history. Uh, you know, I, I don't think anybody really is going to say that the CIA should never be doing any of this kind of stuff. It's uh, what can we learn about it from the ecosystem and what are the implications for the rest of us. And, and I would encourage the, the targeted stuff is really, really, really interesting, but for most of us, that doesn't really matter. We should be focusing on you know, bulk collection and things that suck up lots and lots of information that includes all of us and then used in other ways. Um, and unless there's a, a Snowden in the audience, oh, and even if you were in the audience, the CIA couldn't use it domestically in the US, um, but unless there is a Snowden in the audience who's about to go to Canada, 
Um, most people are not going to be the target of the CIA on this, and if that is what you're thinking about, then you might be ignoring some of the more uh, pertinent threats like uh, phishing, which right. is where most of us are going to be uh, caught up. So just on, on that note, uh, you know, I, I mean, I think a large number of us in the community, in the like technical and also in the policy communities, have, you know, we've been spending years wondering what the secret stuff is like. And you know, with the Snowden and the Vault 7 documents, we finally got a peek at what the secret stuff is like. And I was actually, you know, my reaction to it, and, and maybe this isn't everybody's uh, reaction, but my reaction was a, a little bit comforted by the fact that the secret stuff isn't really all that different from what I imagined. There's very little stuff that has sort of changed my understanding of what is possible, right? There's no nothing that's required us to rewrite any laws of physics or and anything like that. They don't seem to have, you know, there's little evidence that the NSA has a quantum computer, which would be very uh, a very disruptive uh, um, thing to have. Uh, you know, the uh, so uh, you know it, you know the uh, what they're doing is on a scale that was larger than I imagined, but the individual components of it are, you know, what you get if you add money to what everybody, you know, on the outside world kinds of knows, kind of knows and does it at a, at a large scale. For the most part, it's kind of mundane. And it's just, they're really good at it, and they're spending money doing it. So I, I worked for Congress during some of the reauthorization fights, particularly on the 215, which is the domestic metadata authorization, authorization for the 215 program. Um, and having dug into the weeds, I was not surprised that the government was monitoring conversations where at least one person was abroad, no matter where the, the call was originated. I was surprised on the two hops, though. I, I think the, that, that extent surprised a lot of us. Um, that was pretty scary. Explain but two hops. Uh, it some, some people. It, yeah. Um, it, it, you want to explain? Uh, okay, so uh, the, the concept it originally started with the espionage is legal. If the government does it outside of the territory of the United States, they can kind of do whatever they want. So if they, you know, stuck up signals intelligence in a foreign country, that doesn't implicate U.S. Uh, law at all. Uh, however, as the United States started building out the internet and became the central hub of so much technology, increasingly data that they were looking at abroad was now coming through the United States. Combined with the fact that we started changing the cables that go underseas to fiber optic cables, which you can't tap into with submarines, we started to look at these cables coming into the United States and saying, wow, there's a lot of information on there that we would sure like to be able to get. The court said, it's in the United States. You cannot conduct this activity. Uh, so the NSA worked with AT&T and, and developed these boxes that were able to look and see whether or not traffic, whether it was, uh, in the, it was in the United States, but they could tell whether the traffic was going from Iran to the United States or Iran through the United States back to Iran. And if it was going Iran through the United States back to Iran, they called that, that was just transferring through the United States. And sure, the collection might have taken place in the United States, but it wasn't you know, really domestic communications, so the court said it was allowed. Uh, after 9-11, uh, the president, uh, under his own authority, ordered them to start uh, increasing that to say, we are going to take anything that started in another country if it ended in another country. We're going to be able to track that. Um, that went through various different in, uh, considerations and various different things were allowed under various regimes and various legal authorities. For a while they were looking at emails, they don't seem to be doing that anymore. Um, but they started to keep track of the calls coming into the United States. And so a lot of us thought, okay, they might be you know, recording some of those calls, they're probably tracking a lot of them in a database and that's probably a huge uh, volume of data that they're getting. Uh, what we found out after the Snowden leaks is not only were they taking the calls uh, that were coming into the country, they were also mapping uh, two hops out from that. So if I speak to my mother-in-law in Turkey and then I call Blair and then Blair calls Matt, suddenly Matt is implicated because I was talking to somebody who was not in the United States. All of that information was being collected uh, in a central database by the NSA uh, under compelled but secret authority for many, many years. 
to, to finish the story, the USA uh, Freedom Act uh, ended that uh, bulk collection by the NSA, but created a system where the NSA can go directly to the providers with the information that they are requesting and get uh, a very speedy response the, uh, from AT&T that I talked to Blair and then from Verizon that uh, Blair talked to Matt. Uh, but it's no longer bulk collected in its entirety by the NSA. Right, one last quick question, I think. Um, so you were talking, this thing's cool. Um, <laughs> so you were, you were talking about Germany earlier. Um, so internationally with our allies and then with our competitors or foes, what have been the impacts and reactions of what's been exposed to Vault 7? Um, so I think Vault 7, well, at least we don't know if Vault 7 has had that big a impact as the Snowden leaks ha had. Mm -hmm. Because during Snowden, you had all these stories that, you know, we upset Brazil, we upset Germany, we upset the UK, where, you know, stories like we were actually tapping into a Angela Merkel's phone. Um, I think Vault 7 has sort of, I mean, if you are a fairly experienced German official, you sort of know that the US has advanced hacking capabilities. The worry comes in if they're using it against us. And while the Vault 7 did not have explicit statements saying that, oh, CIA hacked into this person's phone, I think the only fear which emitted out of that was that, oh, this is how they can do it, so let's be on guard for that. I think other countries would, I think in theory, had gained an advantage over getting these cyber weapons, but it's really hard to tell because so much of that cyber war is not available to the public. You don't see headlines every day, you know. We successfully hacked country X, and it's sort of like a battle report or something. But it's going on as we speak uh, on a constant basis, both from us and to us, offensively and, and defensively. So, unfortunately, it's really difficult to to know that to answer that. Yeah, we're pretty good at sharing too. Uh, there was a, a, a terrorist attack last New Year's Eve in a nightclub in Turkey, uh, and they were able to catch the people who did it because the United States came in and said, "We we hacked them. We know who did it. Here's where they are." Um, so, for the targeted stuff, and when we're when we're good at sharing. Uh, a lot of other countries seem to be fairly happy with us on that. Uh, there's uh, some concern right now in Europe in that there is a, uh, a safe harbor agreement that allows American companies to transfer data about Europeans back and forth across the Atlantic. Um, that's uh, the privacy shield, which is allows that transfer to take back. But the European courts have said that that is only valid if that we have an equivalent standard of data protection in the United States that we have in Europe. Uh, we probably do not um, because of programs uh, like 702 and uh, like PRISM and Upstream. Um, but that's a little bit difficult for the European governments who don't want to cut off that data flow, who don't want to shut down all of the businesses that uh, work across the Atlantic. And it is a difficult issue that is uh, talked about in different ways. On the one hand, European regulators want to be very strong, and they're about to implement the GDPR, the data Pro General Data Protection Act or regulation. Uh, but they also don't want to turn off these programs, which they are seen as being particularly valid, as are particularly useful to them as terrorism in uh, continental Europe is seems to be increasing. All right, thank you for coming, everyone. We've ran over time, but feel free to come up and ask anyone questions.